So there is a local entrepreneur rapper musician named JB. I think we all know JB. So he's opening up a pizza concert yeah, called Pizza Side Pizza House, and he had a soft launch last night, and had all the pizza out was so good. And he has a vegetarian pizza called the Garden Oaks. Okay. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's yeah. Like that. So you your grand for Garden Oaks, and have to come back pizza there. Okay, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> All right, um, and then we have Mr. Clarence Ellis, who is an alumni of the Overshire High School in McAllister, and graduated the year before integration, is that correct? Just one year before integration. And he is also a veteran, community leader, and historic preservationist who does a lot of work understanding his history and the intersection between black lives and Native American communities. He has his own company and is working with the alumni committee of the Overture to save the high school and revitalize it. And he and I connected last summer and now we're here. So welcome. Round of applause for George and Mr. Ellis. Let's give it for the people. Um, and well done to each of you again. And last but not least, we have Mr. Herbert Key, who graduated from the Overture High School with honors valedictorian three years before the school was integrated in 1968. After graduating, he attended Langston University before he was drafted into the U.S. Army serving in Vietnam. When he returned home, he attended Central State College in Edmond, then Oklahoma City University before beginning his employment career life at the Oklahoma Security Commission, then the U.S. Postal Service, and finishing his career at 25 years with the Oklahoma City Fire Department as Deputy, me, Deputy Fire Marshal. Through his upbringing, teaching, and education, he became an entrepreneur, one who organized and assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. And he had numerous opportunities, some successful, others not as much as he shares, but we know we're gonna learn so much from you today. Just to keep it. thank you for being here. So I'll begin with a few questions, and I'm gonna open it up for our students. They've actually been preparing and working on questions to ask you. Um, but I'm going to kick us off. And students, I wanted to give an announcement that um, as you're listening, be taking notes of what you're hearing and capturing these stories, and specifically as it relates to any of the cultural assets that you might hear, um, and the high points and, and good things about their community projects and their schools, as well as some of the challenges that are um, impacting uh, their progress in their communities as well, because you all are going to have a journal activity where you reflect on this discussion, and we're going to use what you all have captured as assets and as challenges to inform the design activity we're doing in class next week. So just make sure you're listening and kind of picking up on those details and taking your notes so you can do the journal so we can do the activity next week. Vanessa, I have a question. Yes. Can you explain uh, what a cultural asset is? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I have a good definition of your journal that I've placed in here. <laughs> But a cultural asset can be tangible or intangible and represents the different elements of what makes a person or a community's identity. So it can be music, it can be language, it can be rituals and gatherings and meetings. And it's really what, again, creates and, and adds to someone's identity in a community. So we can look at that in a tangible sense, like maybe there was a room or a space or a place outside and some of the school ideas and memories they'll be sharing with us, or it could be something intangible, like maybe a thoughts or something more abstract that's still an asset, but maybe is not something in the built form. Does that make sense? And then I also put a definition in your journal. <laughs> we'll probably say that a lot more clearer than I did, but basically an element of someone or a space of identity is a cultural asset that is positive. All right, so to kick off the discussion, I'd love to just invite each of you to share briefly about your school story. Maybe spend a minute or two just kind of sharing what the school history is about. Um, we can start with you, so you don't mind. Yeah. We have a mic right here. I think it should be on. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Davis, and as Nessa mentioned, I moved to Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, about a a year and a half ago now, through this program called Tulsa Remote. And Tulsa Remote is funded by the largest philanthropist in the state of Oklahoma, George Kaiser, through his family foundation. And so uh, I'd like to say that my journey is part of like this spiritual calling to build this black boarding school here in Oklahoma. And that started, that journey started November 2018. 
And I, at the time, was teaching 11th and 12th grade students in Kansas City, Kansas. And I was working on my second master's. And the master's program is education, teaching English as a second language. And then I also had a certificate of international advocacy and leadership. And so, long story short, I'm very spiritual. I like to tell people that. And so, like, this whole thing is like a spiritual journey for me. And I was praying one night, and I was just like, you know, God, this ain't it. You know, like, the, the way in which uh, public education is a private, rural, suburban, like, no matter where I, I go, I, I see the same tropes of, like, student achievement gaps or the, the school to prison pipeline. And as an ethnographer, and so an ethnographer is a person who studies cultures by being immersed in the environment, um, and that's my uh, first master's in my background. So as an ethnographer, I've always felt like this insider and outsider point of view when it came to the school system. Like, I am a teacher, quote unquote, through this nonprofit. I never received my teacher credentials, so I didn't go the traditional route. And so it's like, I am a teacher, but I'm not really a teacher. And there are some, like, there are some there are problems, there's prefaces here. Um, so, Long story short, praying, and then I went to bed one night, and I heard a voice say, you are to go to black boarding school. And so I got out of my bed and started pacing my apartment, writing notes, and that led me fast forward to uh, watching a documentary in March 2019 about the all black towns of Oklahoma. And so up until that point, I was thinking the school would be in Missouri or Canada. I was just like, this United States is not ready for a black woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so um, throughout that journey, ironically, I realized that before the 1954 Board of Education decision, there were over 100 black boarding schools in the United States. And that's not even a century ago. You know, and so it's just like, wait, out of 100 boarding schools, there's four current still in operation, but those are still, you know, barely surviving or holding on. Um, and so, two things occurred. One, I realized this was part of a purpose, my like calling to go to black boarding school. And then two, I realized this is how we used to educate our students 75, 80 years ago. And what happened? And so, um, I like to say that I'm kind of rebuilding with a twist. It's still the past, you know, bringing that back into um, the present educational landscape, but it is 2.0, right? So like we have technology like never before. And we have ways to, to learn and integrate like never before. And so um, that led me on this journey. I formed the board, the school board, as of last October. And so I think that um, one thing I really want to stress is like, this is a strategic you know, process. It's not something to rush just to meet today's times. Um, I want this school to last as my time, my generation, um, and to replicate the school. So not just have one black boarding school, but how does it look to have an international boarding school across the globe? Um, so the mission statement for Kena Come International is to educationally unite, empower, and inspire children within the African diaspora ages 12 or 18 while providing safe, holistic living environments for them. You set me up. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, um, and the Oklahoma City Alumni Chapter, we have about 100 active members. There's even more uh, that aren't active within the Oklahoma City Metro. Um, and we've been looking for a property uh, to own, uh, just because alumni chapters are more focused on service projects, giving back to the community. We do a lot of mentoring with at-risk students um, in, in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, you know, we do what we can to give back to the community, and we needed a facility to grow the programs that we have, um, as well as a place for us to meet, to kind of do planning and things like that. Um, and so I was on what was called the the Housing Committee, so we could find a place to, you know, purchase and, and, and start, you know, growing some of the activities that we do. So we started our fund foundation because our chapter, of course, couldn't own the property. Um, and as we were getting everything off and running, we we're like, hey, this will be a two or three year process. We'll raise money and then we'll go and start looking for something. Um, as we were doing that, the Oklahoma City Public School District superintendent came to us and said, hey, we have this school that we're about to, you know, put up for sale and it's an open bid process and 
you guys are welcome to submit a bid package and the school, the school board will just decide who uh, gets, gets the property, gets the purchase of the property. So we went from thinking we're going to move really slow to, okay, we got to do everything, <laughs> kind of in reverse order by the school and then raise the money to fix it up. So um, we submitted our, packet, our, our bid package and we were awarded the school. Um, we got it for, it's a 27,500 square foot building, sits on 10 acres of land. It's in Northeast Oklahoma City, about a mile east of I-35. It's kind of the 16th and Bryan area. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in Northeast Oklahoma City, but most of it's happening between MLK and Lincoln. East of I-35 is kind of forgotten about. Um, this school sits in the Garden Oaks neighborhood. So there's eight or 900 uh, houses that surround the property. Um, if you look at the demographics of the area, you know, 95% of the students are on free or reduced lunch. You know, 65% of the kids born, um, kids under five live in poverty. Um, if you look at the health outcomes uh, for the 73117 zip code, you know, it's the, wor the worst or second worst <laughs> in the whole city um, for diabetes, for you know, heart disease, all the major, major diseases. And so we looked at this school and said, hey, this is something we think, you know, we can purchase and then we can convert into a community center. And so what we're trying to do is we're going to have a portion, our kind of four pillars that we're going to set up programs around, community service, civic engagement, health and wellness, and educational outreach. So we'll have one wing designated for student services, K through 12. We'll have, you know, mentoring program, after school tutoring, there'll be a computer lab in there, a library. Um, we already have uh, what we call our Alpha Boys Institute where we're mentoring uh, middle school students at a couple of the middle schools in the area. We'll have a space center for them. Uh, we want to do summer STEM camps and things like that for kids who may not, you know, in that neighborhood or in the surrounding area who may not have access or opportunities to do things like that. Um, we'll have a, a multi-purpose room that we can do free dance classes, martial arts classes, music classes, things like that. The outdoor area will be, it's 10 acres, so it's huge. Um, we'll have it set up to, with the, you know, a walking track for seniors to come and exercise. We'll have you know, a new playground, sports fields, things like that. And now on the other way, we're going to set it up for adult services. So Metro Tech wants to come and have some remote classes out there so folks don't have to come to their campus to, you know, do vocational tech learning. Um, Lynn Institute uh, wants to partner with us on some of, our, some of our health and wellness activities so we can do health fairs and make sure folks are, you know, understand what their, you know, blood pressure and things like that, what all that is, so we can get them linked up with the right folks to, you know, improve their health outcomes. We want a space, spaces, uh, conference spaces for other organizations within the neighborhood that are doing great work. Um, so we're in the early stages of raising money for this project. We'll need, you know, about a million dollars to get the building completely operational, um, 300000 to get a portion of it operational, which we'll hope, hopefully we'll have that <laughs> by the end of the year, maybe sooner. Um, we're working on that. Um, so that's kind of the history of, of what we're trying to do with the project. The school was built in 1954, so you know what happened that year. Um, <laughs> we actually have a 94-year-old gentleman in our chapter who used to teach there, was a principal there. So it's kind of, we have that connection um, with some of the folks in our chapter who taught and went to school at, at, at the Garden Oaks Elementary School. Um, it stopped being a school in about 2003 just because, you know, population in that area dropped and couldn't support it. So it's the district was leasing it out to another nonprofit for the past 15 or 20 years. Um, so there's a lot of issues with the property. It needs a new roof. You know, there's a bunch of interior remodeling that needs to be done. Um, there's asbestos in there, all that kind of stuff. So we're working on, on ways to raise money to get rid of that through grants and um, philanthropic groups supporting us. Um, but in the meantime, we're still holding activities outside of the property. So we did a back to school drive. Um, in about 20 minutes, we gave away over 250 backpacks and school supplies. We did a trunk or treat event. We had a few hundred kids come through for that. We did a, a food drive. We fed over 400 families. Um, we're planning a blood drive uh, here in, in, in uh, next month in March. Um, so there's things we can do um, while we get the building up and running. There's things we can do and utilize the outdoor areas of the facility. So that's kind of um, the history of the background of what we're trying to do. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them. We were out here. Two of them. We were out here. 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 We were out here.
back to Kansas City. Uh, similar, similar things happened to me. Uh, uh, just real brief history. Uh, we have an alumni uh, reunion every two years. Uh, and uh, the only ones I miss was when I was in the military. Uh, but uh, never miss them, and I uh, love my school. Uh, some uh, very educated people across the country now graduated from there. Our teachers were superb, uh, especially our principal, Dr. Will A. Strong. Uh, but uh, one day, uh, my classmate came to me and told me, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, one day, uh, it's hard enough to catch up with these other <laughs> Uh, my, uh, my classmate, which is my uh, business partner, told me that the school was going to be uh, up for bid, same as George uh, found theirs. Uh, so I called the uh, president of the alumni, and she was saying that, oh, uh, I think we're going to uh, let them go ahead and bulldoze this down and just make a part. I said, no, 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 that is not going to get it. So I said, okay, thank you, bye. <laughs> and uh, we immediately went over to the superintendent's office, and uh, she told us what we could do and how we could do it. And she was pulling for us to keep that history, that history alive for years and years to come. Uh, and she felt like uh, my business partner, he's a principal uh, at the high school down there. So she knew him well. Uh, his integrity was sound and all that good stuff. Uh, so we uh, made the bid and got the property. And, uh, I, I take my blames. We all gonna make mistakes, but you gotta own up to them if you want to get it right. Uh, and I take my blame for about four years. It sit there vacant. I had some other business projects that I was working on, and uh, it just kind of got by. Well, in that four year time, the neighborhood, the community that need the services that we're gonna be trying to provide for them, uh, they took advantage of it. Broke windows out, went in and vandalized, a uh, whole, whole bunch of mess. Uh, so now we had, we took a step back from where we were when we purchased it. So now we're back out on the catch up side. And we've been, uh, the purpose of it is to do similar, uh, as the panel has mentioned already, is that a portion of the uh, building will be for nonprofit organizations. We are going to, we are filing for our 501c3, haven't gotten it approved yet, but once we do, well then we'll reach out to the other nonprofit organizations and they can house in there for that discounted rate uh, just to serve the community. Uh, after school programs, battered women, veterans programs, since we veterans, uh, and, and things that will help the community stay stable and grow. Uh, we'll also have uh, uh, our gymnasium, uh, my Oklahoma City chapter, alum alumni chapter. Uh, some many years ago, we got our gymnasium. It's uh, on the National Register. So that's something important already for us. And uh, the gentleman that uh, uh, helped us get that passed, uh, he now believes that we can get the entire school as a national site, which would be another positive move to reach our goals at a quicker time. But the main thing is, is to serve the community, activities. Uh, we'll have an event center where weddings and parties and, and holidays and everything can be there. The auditorium will be used for community use. Uh, and, uh, for his community, as long as the label community use, there won't be any charge for them to book and have the activity. <coughs> we look at in the summer months, having a movie night type uh, uh, a week, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday or every week, have a movie night for the kids in the neighborhood. There's a lot of kids in that area that broke my windows out. <laughs> uh, so we're going to give them something to do uh, and, and let them know that we as a community are concerned about your life and your progress uh, uh, can be made. Uh, and let them come in, we'll have popcorn and project in the whole nine yard, and uh, it's going to be fun. We uh, purchased it also 
because it's in conjunction with a park that's right across the street from it, called Michael J. Hunter Park. He was the, one, he was the first uh, veteran that was killed in the Vietnam War, and he just happened to be a, a black guy. So it was uh, Michael J. Hunter Park, and they made major improvements on the park. Uh, we got the next street. Uh, one of the uh, McAllister police officers was uh, uh, African American, and uh, they named that street after him. So it's all one complex there. The school, of course, sits on the whole city block, parks right across the street. Uh, Y'all might not remember this, and I'm going to pass this mic, because sometimes you might have to take this mic when I get started. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had a May Day event last year. And I don't know if you know what that is. When we went to school, that was the best day of the school year. Because you didn't have to go to class. <laughs> you brought sack lunch, and you went to that park across the street, and you played all kind of games, and fun, and you got mad when the bus stopped. I ain't ready to go. <laughs> uh, so we did that, and it was very uh, nice turnout. We had the mayor, the city council people, uh, all the neighborhood kids. We had free food to give away, had music, had games, and they loved it. So we'll do that again this year. And I'm going to stop right there because I can get started. <laughs> right, don't go no longer than I did. Um, well, I'll tell you something. I come with my data, folks. I come with my data. Where's my come? I don't know what it is. Because I'm hired. My name is Clarence Ozzes. Vanessa said. And the reason why I came here is for assistance to save our school. Okay? Right across the street, wherever your library is, the uh, Western History Library, you have to have an appointment to go to that library because they got documents of whatever reason that's here on campus. Okay? I'm inviting all of you guys to come with me on an appointment, uh, if you can make it. Okay, I don't know what the appointment time is, the date or whatever, but I've asked Vanessa to talk to Sean, who is your director. Shane. Shane? Yes. Okay, they're trying to set an appointment time and date. I'm inviting you to come. The reason I'm inviting you guys to come is because my great, great, great grandfather was an Indian. He was half Choctaw and half Negro, that's what the document says. Okay, I prefer to call him half black, but the document says Negro, so I don't know what the documentation <laughs> Point of it is, he was uh, one of, no, he was one of the two genealogists found that actually had an interview. And during that interview, uh, excuse me, hold oh, there. All right. <laughs> Good, right this is over there at the Western Hitler, uh, Library. This is the document. It says that he was half chopped out. He was a, uh, a, a medicine man. He'd go out in the woods and get his herbs for, to medicine for the tribes. Okay? I'm proud of that. That's my bloodline. That's who I am. Okay? He's a medicine man. <laughs> I'm the descendant of the medicine man with that bloodline, which is I'm going to contact the chief of the Choctaw Nation, who's fighting for the Freemans. Okay, from what I understand about the Freemans is back in the day, uh, if you wanted 40 acres of mule, you saw it your rights. Okay, so <laughs> during that time, a lot of Choctaws went for the deal. Fact of the matter is, this chief, the name is Gary Batten, is trying to fight for the rights for the Choctaw. I'm trying to apply for my CIDB card, whatever that uh, acronym is, as well as my other family members. Here is my breakdown of my family tree, tied me directly to Jack County. Okay, so we got Jack Campbell 
And then we go to where the Trail of Tears, because there's a story behind the Trail of Tears and how I ended up, or my family ended up here in Oklahoma. I want to jump here a second. This is Dr. Strong that Herb talked about. I'm proud of this lady because
That means black, indigenous, and people of color. And I remind you about Bob because it reminded me of Tupac. <laughs> okay? And so, but the thing of it is, I'm reading these terms so when I apply for this, this grant application, okay, that I'll be able to tell them, this is what our school is trying to do. It's like he said, what they're doing, I want them to know that we qualify through our 501c3, right, to, for the grant money to get the roof on in place. We've got to put a roof on it, we've got to gut it out and renovate it inside, and then we rent out the office space for different, you know, like, yeah, we can do some community things, but we need to rent the office space to be able to make sure the school is self-sustaining. In other words, the bills got to be paid. You know, we can't spend all our money on board projects. We've got to have at least some space out. And I hope to uh, have a space in there to where things like uh, the medicine man, I have a picture, I, I forgot to bring it up here, folks. Indian, who I want to hang in the office space for my Jack Cameron Foundation. <coughs> okay? Mr. Ellis, I want to make sure that we can get to all the questions. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I have a lot of questions I want to ask. I want to make sure the students get the opportunity as well. So thank you all so much for sharing those beautiful connections. I think this is all in line with Rise and what you've been reading just since the start of the semester that schools are so much more than a place to learn. It's so much deeper than that. And I think this hearing you all's testimonies and connections and leadership that many of you doing this outside of your full-time job and taking care of your family speaks truth to power and how critical of an asset neighborhood schools are to the community. So I want to turn it over to uh, Simone and George. And here, Simone, you're kind of in a unique situation here because you're building you're working on building up a school, new construction, programming, and a, and a model that I'm learning is historic. Uh, I didn't know it was historic to the black community, but you're building a historic model in a more modern context. And George, you're revitalizing one. So I'd love to hear in your two different journeys, what are some of the hurdles or obstacles that you face in trying to bring your concept to life? For sure. So initially when I um, started on this journey to go to Black Boarding School, I was looking for a school founder mentor. So in Kansas City, mind you, again, back in Kansas City, and I would reach out to just uh, those in the community in Kansas City, Missouri, and in Kansas City, Kansas, around school founding. If you started a charter school, if you started a private school, um, there's a boarding school outside of Kansas, or outside of Kansas City, Kansas. And so I also traveled to the boarding school, just kind of like getting an idea of the concept of building a school and then also sustaining the school. Um, but the struggle is real. <laughs> I mean, like, I also traveled to Oklahoma and I visited some private school founders here in the Oklahoma City area. Well, we're in Oklahoma, but Oklahoma City area, and so. Um, I concluded quickly that this journey will need multiple mentors, not just one. I think that was a kind of resound realization, like, okay, so this is bigger than um, just the network that I currently have. And it would take just kind of the, the gems that people will share with you and then figure out how to navigate. And so when I realized that the school needed to be, um, so, Initially, I didn't know what the school structure was going to, how it was going to form. I'm so sorry. Can you kind of share what a boarding school is for maybe people who are not familiar with it? Yeah, that? so there's multiple concepts of boarding schools, again, on this journey that we realized. So um, typically, depending on the, I would say the cause, like the, the problem or the solution you're trying to do. So there's like therapeutic boarding schools for students who may um, struggle with adapting to like the, the normal K through 12 public education system. Um, there's boarding schools for the, and there's an international, international context of boarding schools that I learned, of course, like in, um, really in Europe, but also I would say North, the Northeastern of the United States, there's like a plethora of boarding schools like in Massachusetts and New Jersey and so, 
I was actually able to tour boarding school um, in Massachusetts, or actually New York, it was upstate New York, um, this past September. And so ultimately, I think that once you're on the path, the journey of wanting to recognize what a boarding school is, ultimately it's students living on campus for a certain age, for a certain time period, if that is um, year round, if that's you know, Monday through Friday or the entire weekend. And so there's so many levels and experiences of boarding school systems. And I think that it is new rhetoric, um, new language that is being adapted. When I started going around telling people I wanted to go to black boarding school, you can just imagine the bases I received and like the inquiries like, what does that look like? <laughs> you know, and so ironically, uh, I used to tell people like the black Hogwarts, you know, like Harry Potter. And <laughs> You know, and so even that context of like Harry Potter for me was was funny because I had no context with Harry Potter growing up. My parents were real spiritual, and so I, I never even read Harry Potter until literally like three years ago. And I'm grateful for the experience reading it as an adult on this journey because I was able to take notes. You know, I was able to really use J.K. Rowling's imaginary, you know, world and, and what has come about it. 20 years later, you know, like there's Harry Potter amusement parks, you know, like there's just so much out of the creativity of a mind. And so using them. And I took notes out of Harry Potter, like realized that he was an orphan. You know, he didn't know his parents. And it wasn't until he was 11 years old where it was just like this calling, this magic. You have this magic, you know, and I'm like, black people have magic, you know, black children have magic. And I want to tap into that magic. And so, Literally using Harry Potter and his fiction, you know, fictionary characters and realizing how this world can be created around the safety and also the magic of black babies. Um, so, yeah, there's different varieties of boarding schools depending on wherever you are. And that, and that language can be very traumatic based on who you are. Um, again, within the Native American space, you know, boarding schools can be completely different from the African American journey with boarding schools, and I really want to highlight, you know, recognizing, depending who you are, you may have a different experience within a boarding school setting. Um, and so, ultimately, this, I would deduce and say boarding schools run two programs, an educational program and a residential program. And that's what Kingdom Ken International will hold, two programs. And so, um, I'm not even sure where we are this yes. point. <laughs> so you're right on. I'm going to just segue on to George. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, I tried to watch Harry Potter, but it's just too long. I can't do it. Well, not really, because I didn't even watch the movies. Oh, no, yeah. I yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I read 140 characters a <laughs> month. Um, you're, you're wanting to know the obstacles that we've got. Yeah, it's basically a project. It's been a couple of things for us. Number one is, you know, I didn't seek out being a chairman of a nonprofit organization. I don't, didn't have much experience serving on boards of any kind. Um, so ramping up and kind of learning how to get your 501c3 status, how to file for articles of incorporation, how to write bylaws, how to pick board members that bring something to the table, whether it be accounting experience, legal experience, connections within the community, things like that. Um, that was a, a learning process for me. Um, I was fortunate that, like I said, our chapter has about 100 active members in all types of professions from you know, attorneys to accountants, military, teachers, everything. So we, we had a good you know, group of people to pull from, but for me it was just, it's basically like standing up a business, a corporation, and running it. So ramping up to do that was, uh, you know, tough. Uh, it took a lot of time. Um, the second piece is, you know, it was easy, quite easy for us to raise the initial funds to purchase the school through donations. That's kind of what we did is went out and solicited donations. So that initial money, which again, we got a really good deal, <laughs> uh, was, was easy. But then it's like, okay, how do you go from, you know, this small amount of money to raising a million dollars? So um, me and my day job as a, as a commercial real estate broker, I'm in contact with a lot of folks who, you know, are, are wealthy and well off and spend a lot of money, and not just in the business world, but also in the political world. So I just started, um, you know, trying to tell our story. So the first thing we did was, I was like, we need to get something out in the newspaper so we can publicize it. 
So we kind of had our groundbreaking event. Um, we had you know, some of the city council folks and other leaders in the community come to speak. And they ended up being, and then we had a newspaper reach out to us, and that was on the news, a couple of news programs. Um, and then we had someone from the Oklahoma reach out to us and want to do a story. And I was like, sure. So I met her over there, kind of walked through the thing. And I ended up being on the front page of the paper, uh, which is a big boost for us. So that kind of helped get the message out. And so when I started calling people, saying, hey, here's what we're trying to do. You know, we went and created some marketing materials. We, uh, I was like, here's what we're trying to do. And I just started having meetings, and I'd meet with one person. They say, hey, go and talk to this person. Go and talk to that person. That's how I actually got connected with Vanessa. Um, and so I'm continuing to do that. And it's opened up, you know, a wide range of possibilities. Because the biggest hurdle right now for us is how to raise the money. How do we get someone? We, everyone I talk to loves what we're trying to do. They believe in the story. How do I get that belief into writing us a check? Um, so that's been the hard part. Um, there are a lot of philanthropic groups within our city that support projects like this. Um, so we're working, we're working, we're working that angle. We are uh, applying for a lot of grants. Uh, basically went from not ever wanting to write a grant to figuring out how to do it and starting that process, which is very, very in depth. And like you mentioned, you got to have the right language and lingo and things like that that are going to get people to read what you're, you're talking about um, and, and support you. So, um, so I think you know I'm encouraged that we're going to get, and I think once we get operational, like I said, if we can get that initial three hundred thousand or so to get a portion of the building operational, it'll a lot, be a lot easier after that. But um, I'm encouraged that you know we're going to get some support from a uh, philanthropic group. Um, we already have some support from Oklahoma City Public Schools. They're going to support us over the next three years with some funding. Um, just through small donations, we've raised enough money to do things like get construction plans done, and, uh, have enough money to pay for building insurance and maintenance and things like that. So we have in reserve probably enough money to last us two to three years. Um, we're still getting small donations in, but it's just getting that financial support is kind of our next hurdle. Um, I'm impatient. I like to go fast and get it done and move on to the next thing. And so I'm just going to continue to knock on doors and tell our story. And hopefully someone's going to believe us enough to say, hey, here's you know, $100,000, here's $200,000. And for a lot of groups, that is nothing. They <laughs> spend that out. If you look at some of the well-known organizations, they get that kind of donation, those kind of donations, whether it be the Boys and Girls Club or the Y or some of these other groups, they get money like that all the time. So being a startup nonprofit, you know, not having that history behind you has been kind of the biggest hurdle to get to get that funding. But I think once we once we get that initial funding and get going and get operational, um, this is gonna take off from there. So Would you like to add some of these? We got the same story, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to do the same thing. And, and, and we looking at this through the nonprofit eyes. I'm a not entrepreneur. I like to make a profit. I do not like the word nonprofit. Uh, uh, but it will benefit us and help us to get to the goals that we uh, want to reach. I know what it took to start. I see clearly what it's going to look like on what I consider really cutting the day. You know, all those steps. But uh, each one of those steps takes another group of people that you've got to be in contact with, that you've got to find and, and make your deals uh, uh, so that you can accomplish what you want to do. Uh, funding is definitely the biggest thing. If I was uh, starting up a, a small uh, uh, for profit business, I'm going to go borrow me some money because I can't wait. I need to go ahead and do it. But we're doing it as a nonprofit, so we we got to follow the steps. Uh, the language that they say, you got to know the language when you're filling out these applications because uh, if you don't have some of that language in the applications uh, and, and uh, paperwork, well, then uh, they start and they, oh, okay, this one looks better over here. They immediately move to the next one. So then, and, and we're going to make mistakes. We, we, we made our first mistake trying to do a nonprofit uh, with the short form, wanting the easy way out. To get to where you want to go is never easy, okay? You got to work to get there. Uh, and when we, uh, we filled it out, sent it in, 
And, uh, and I knew it was one question on there that told me I couldn't do that, but I listened to my committee. And uh, they sent it back in about three or four weeks. Say so, uh, denied because uh, we didn't meet that one line item uh, uh, to qualify, and we'd have to use the long form. And my committee people, that's some of my problems, uh, <laughs> is that uh, when you're talking about, when they said long form, that already long form. <laughs> and when they printed the whole thing out, it's kind of churches and hospitals and schools and everything, that's 30 plus pages. But when you're just doing it for charitable benefits, it's not 10, 9 pages. But that word, it reminds me when my kids was playing basketball when I was a coach. We playing this one team and they looked up and I guarantee you, this, this is uh, middle school or grade school, little league. This one guy come out of the closet, out of the, out of the back room, and he's tall as George. And everyone in the little kids seen Oh man, you playing that? And they they already done quit. You know? I said he might not even be a start. You're gonna give what you got to get what you want. That's all it is. But those are the difficult things. The other difficult things in a small community uh, like my hometown, Callister, those people are comfortable in their life. They really don't have a vision. And if you don't have a vision, you'll perish, that's what somebody said. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and they don't, because they live there all their life. Uh, you know, it's not a, a growing uh, a community. There are some younger people there, but most of the people that make the decision are the adults, uh, and half of them seniors, uh, and uh, they come. Change is a hard thing to uh, address to any group of people. We just don't want to, even though it might be good for us. So those are the basic things, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm a stubborn person. I see that ribbon cutting that, okay? <laughs> and I know I'm gonna do whatever it takes, as long as I'm still on this side, uh, to cut that ribbon. And we'll get there one day in the future. Amen. Okay, I'm going to keep this short, okay? <laughs> here's, here's, here's what I'm at, folks. This panel, okay, was put together because I shared my vision with Vanessa. I really want you guys to know how much I really appreciate that. It really means a lot to me. Okay, it makes me feel like it's obtainable, my goals. Regardless, whether I get the money to save the school or not, I'm still clean and sober, okay? I feel good about doing something positive with my community. But here's what I want to share with you guys specifically. Because Vanessa and I had shared our vision as far as school innovation, she did a walkthrough. Her and a couple of her colleagues, it was Ron and his wife, right? Okay, here's what I wanted to present to you guys as a class project. Because this is under the architectural field, I feel that it would be of benefit to you students to have knowledge of surveying. What I know about surveying, and I got my knowledge because I was in I was at a trade school as a draftsman, but that, because I was getting straight A's, I was uh, picked up to be riding the survey helpers for this particular company called Brum and Brummett. The reason why I'm sharing this yet with you guys is because the particular project I'd like for you guys to be involved with is the North Star. Now you might want to ask me why it was the North Star. What is it? That's what she's asking. I'm sorry. That surveying sounds like a need. That you might, that just in your revitalization efforts is surveying the need that yeah, I wanted to show you what I, yeah, I wanted to show, share with you guys the information as to the actual measurements of the school ground itself. In order to calibrate your transit to shoot the distance from one block to the next, you got to get your calibration from the North Star. I wanted to share that information with you guys. How to set up a tripod, what is a plumb model? Okay, how do you hold a rod? 
these are things you're gonna need if you're gonna be contractors. I don't know how far you're gonna go into architecture field, but if you can't read the, the blueprints, and the blueprints is tied in with the surveyor, okay, you know, two and two is four, right? I wanna share that project with you guys. Think about it and get back with me. All right, thank you, Mr. Ellis. Sure. Uh, all right, so with that being said, what is, you all have shared a lot about your goals and the vision and how you really see these spaces coming back to life in a way that serves your surrounding community. And Simone, I would love to hear too from your perspective because you're kind of, you're building a community that has a lot of vacancy and you all are working on projects that are surrounded by these neighborhoods. And so I'm curious as to how your plan plans to connect with the surrounding community your context and a lot of legacy and what you want as well. So initially when I came down here for the <clears throat> look at land and I would say the black townships, because again that was my interest for that PBS documentary, uh, the first place I traveled to was Tallahassee, Oklahoma. And Tallahassee is the oldest surviving all black town in Oklahoma. And it was featured on the documentary. So I reached out to Mayor Curran after watching it and just share actually like my ancestral history, my ancestral journey also connects to Tallahassee in so many ways. Um, my great great grandmother was from like the Muskogee, we always knew from the Muskogee area, but it wasn't until I became town manager and I was like fully invested into the works I'm doing here in Oklahoma that I realized um, the 1920 census had my family listed in Porter, Oklahoma, which is literally overlapping with Tallahassee. And so I have like this ancestral connection to the town as well. So after meeting the mayor that first time, July 2019, she told me that she wanted to boarding school in her town. And I was like, uh, you know, I'm still looking at some other black towns like Red Bird, Tide. Um, and uh, she was like, no, I want you to build your school here. So we went back and forth for a while. And uh, I was like, oh, Right, this was going to be Tallahassee. And saying yes to her and to Tallahassee, I feel like my life just completely changed. And again, that was 2019, July 2019. And fast forward, um, I started to make a journey, a trip here once a month in 2020. And that's when I found out about Tulsa Remote. So long story short, through this process of trying to get into that boarding school, I became um, town manager of Tallahassee. And it then became obvious that like, in order to build a school, you have to first build this town. And that was very daunting, very overwhelming, but I'm just really excited about the process we've been able to do in the last 16 months. And as of last year, or last month, I actually uh, scaled back to create an organization, an LLC, called Black Towns Municipal Management, and it's short for BTMM. And I'm realizing that the problems on a micro level within Tallahassee is actually a macro level when you look at U.S. black townships. Like there's more than, Oklahoma has the most historically, but there's other operational black towns currently in the United States. And it's fun and also again like very daunting to, to think about how to create this school, this black boarding school in the Otis black town, but again how to replicate it in other black townships, or again, in other black spaces abroad. Um, and so there is a, a vacant, a lot of vacant areas in Tallahassee, and I feel like having this kind of um, two lens, you know, school founder and also again, now municipal work, local government work, there's such a, a tandem. They go hand in hand when you look at um, school revitalization and also in these communities. And to this point, like, I see my elders here really getting emotional about the school settings, and we were in, we as in the Washington, the Washington Post um, was here this past week, kind of following my journey, and we were in Tap, Oklahoma, and the former mayor, Cap, is just like, you know, we should not launch our school, we should not launch our school, and that was 30 years ago, and again, seeing the emotional impact from my elders to now, it, it hits me, because again, like, the school system is the, the vibrancy of the community, the vibrancy of the town, of the township. When you lose your school, you lose your people, you lose your, you lose your children, you lose the future community members that can be raised there and, and grow their families there. And so, 
when we talk about vacancy, it's it's resounding, I guess. It's, it can't even really put into words if you see empty lots or vacant land and to know the potential that can be done with it, the economic development that can be done with it, the sustainability, the vitality of the community that can be done with it. Um, and so it is a unique charge to be kind of building both from scratch, building a new town, ground zero, um, trying to figure out land ownership and lots of families leave their um, the children or their grandchildren land, but it's all broken up into pieces, right? And so it's just like, if you're trying to reclaim land for a government or for a community, what does that look like? And again, I think we're all in a season of new language and new ways of being able to communicate these issues um, like never before. So there, this is a blueprint. This is a blueprint that we're building schools and this is a blueprint for building townships. Yes, yeah, so how does your project connect with your surrounding neighborhood context? So it's most um, of describing that you're in a neighborhood. Right, so. yeah. So, I mean, if you look at certain parts of any city, specifically Oklahoma City, there are just areas that are neglected. Um, you know, we have our MAPS program, and that money is going to certain areas of the city. And you can notice it in things like, hey, when you exit to go to, you know, Northeast Oklahoma City, um, even the exits are just not very big. They're not wide. And you get off and <laughs> it's just, you know, neglected. Uh, they're actually about to expand that part of I-35 and take out some of the neighbors that are, you know, surrounding the freeway through, um, you know, eminent domain. So, so it's just little things like that. If you drive uh, through the neighborhood, you'll see nothing but, they're not nice homes, they're small homes, but the yards are well kept. It's not, you know, you, you're not going to feel afraid going in that community. You're not going to think, you know, you're going to get robbed or your car is going to get broken into or anything like that. Now, back in the 80s, maybe, but now it's not like that. It's, uh, you know, older older folks who lived there a long time. Some of the younger kids who grew up there and may have gotten in trouble are now back and want to revitalize their community. There's a movement to move back into the urban core, especially in Oklahoma City. It's, you know, close to, we're about 10 minutes from downtown. Um, so when we purchased this, the facility, the first thing we did was got connected with the Garden Oaks Homeowners Association. There's actually a very vibrant, uh, vibrant, not vibrant, vibrant, <laughs> sorry, vibrant uh, homeowners association. Uh, we connected with them and started partnering with them on some of the things that we wanted to do, whether it's the backpack drive and things like that. Um, so they've been very helpful telling us, hey, here's what they've given us feedback on what they like to see. Um, when we actually turn on the light, the exterior lights in the building, they were happy to see that because, you know, it's going to, you know, some vandals from coming into that property and destroying it and, you know, decreasing the property values of their homes and things like that. So the community is happy to see, you know, someone, a group that looks like them, coming in, taking a property that would otherwise, you know, be dilapidated and trying to turn it into something that's going to benefit the community. So we've gotten a lot of support from folks that live in that area. We'll, we'll be out there working and people will just stop by and say, hey, what are you guys doing out here? What's going on? And they're so excited that we're there trying to help, you know, not only help that school, you know, not turn into an old beat up property, but putting in services that are going to help folks that really, really need it. And it's a historically underserved area. Like I said, there's no grocery store anywhere near that area. It's a dead food desert. Um, the health outcomes are much worse than that zip code than the rest of the metro. Um, and it's just been, it's been neglected. And the people there care about their community and they want the help and they deserve it. And so we're going to do our part, you know, hopefully make that property a, a beacon of light for that community. Um, we kind of shared our plans with the superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools. His comment to us was, you know, this can be a model, not just for the state, but nationwide. Give these old schools that are going to be shut down because they're no longer having the, the population to support it, or turning into something that can still be beneficial to the community and not just become an eyesore where people are in their living or tearing out the copper and things like that. So. And I love how you all are able to navigate the space now, even though the relations are you're still, you know, identifying funding and resources to help make that happen. It's awesome that you've been able to still add value, even temporarily with the drives and the events and things of that nature so the neighbors can benefit immediately and don't have to wait, you know, however long it would take to get the money, revitalize it, restructure it, get it all sound and open.
open again. It, it's as simple as just keeping the grass cut. The right. school district, you know, they would cut it, but they would let it grow up into a forest before they come out there and cut it. Mm -hmm. We have volunteers that go out there and take care of it and make it look nice. So it just feels like, you know, even though it's empty, it doesn't feel like an empty right. space there. So that goes a long way. And we got neighbors that are across the street helping keep an eye on things for us. So okay. it's, um, you know, so far the, the, the whole process of the project, project, we've got nothing but really good support and positive feedback from the community. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what we're trying to do is to uh, uh, bring life back into that neighborhood where there's activities for the people. Uh, like we say, we got the park across the street from it, which has already got walking trails in it. Uh, they're doing a new splash pad in it for the kids uh, during the summer or warm months. Uh, uh, and uh, it just ties in so much together to, to bring that whole neighborhood back alive. Um, they have a uh, uh, an area of, uh, uh, I guess I use the word project uh, that's nearby where there's a lot of houses that's got younger kids and they don't have anything to do uh, and, and, and they always when uh, they uh, broke the windows out of our structure uh, everybody there just like somebody said 30 years ago uh, you know, well, why they do that? Well, why don't we do something to give them something else to do other than that? And that's what uh, we're looking at, uh, being able to help the, the youth as, when, as much as anybody is, because we'll have a sports league uh, in the gym and uh, everything like that at some point in time. And then, yeah, uh, we're vital to not only the neighborhood, but to the community and to the whole town, because once uh, the activities start flowing, uh, the whole town will benefit. Okay. And I just have one more, and I want to turn it over to our students for any questions they may have. But in this effort of revitalization of Simone Lapeer at the construction school, how are you preserving the history of the school or the culture of the school? And Simone, I know in Tallahassee, there's actually a historic black school called Carnegie Woods in School. That unfortunately, around 2016, Bell took the lives due to a fire. And so, maybe if you have any thoughts or ideas to share about how your new school concept connects to that history in any way, then I'd love to hear what are some ideas or plans that you all have to preserve that history as you reprogram and revitalize the spaces to not be schools, but to be community spaces. Yeah, so when I first met Mayor Kern and we toured Tallahassee, uh, she gave me the story of the Carter G. Woodson School, and at the time that it burned down, she was actually living across the street from it. So currently, there's no roof on the Carter G. Woodson School, and some, I think some of the students here, or was it another class that uh, toured it this past weekend um, when we were in Tallahassee, but there's a feeling, like when you walk into the building, like there's no walls, right? There's no roof, but like there's this feeling of still community, like a spirit. And one of the projects that uh, Tallahassee is currently working on with um, OU and OSU is to figure out what, what to do with that space. They used to have it as a community space, community center used to also, um, at one point, um, it was like a part of the fire department and it was also leased out for a mechanic space area. And so initially, when I came to build a black boarding school, and even still, so Kingdom Come International is a private school, um, independent, and we're still working out school development and fundraising. I know the 
property and land that I want to build on this school, which is close to, again, OU um, helping redesign a sports complex, which is, again, across the street from that Carter G. Woodson School. And so all of this is still close proximity. And I envision still having Carter G. Woodson School revitalized as a community space, but still have Carper, Kingdom Come International, being able to utilize all of the sports complex that community center as the Carter G. Wilson School. Um, so there will be a connection, but when initially I first came and even now, it's still gonna be operated as a Kingdom Community National, still be operated as an independent private school. Um, and with that history of Tallahassee, it's 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 so life changing. I don't know how to explain it. But like um, when I drove to Tallahassee initially years ago, I felt like, right, I felt that I belonged, that my I felt like I had a connection here, even before I knew I had a connection. I mean, so that spirit remains today, and the school is part of that spirit. The A.J. Mason building, which is um, the oldest building in Tallahassee, we kicked off the community cleanup around the A.J. Mason building this past summer. We made U.S. history by revitalizing and connecting to uh, the mayor of L.A. and the mayor of Denver um, through this program called MORE. And so ultimately, all these pockets, again, with the Carter G. Wilson School, all these pockets are here for the rebuilding, for the revitalization of Tallahassee. Kingdom Come International would just be one anchor, you know, out of the anchor industries that we plan to have in Tallahassee. Education is one of those anchors. And I'm really excited to see the connection. And I think at this point, I haven't even yet to really process what that can look like for the future. But I know that, again, having this past where students used to attend, and then now having this like current, you know, present, you know, energy of students, of course there will be some type of, you know, synergistic, you know, energy happening in between. Um, and then just a side note, so part of the Wilson schools was closed due to consolidation in 1990. And so there was a lot of major consolidation, school consolidation closing happening in 1990. And so there's one attack, there's one in Tallahassee. And so, and I'm, I'm sure there's also part of the process of just, again, like black schools closing, rural schools closing. So it's not even just about black spaces, but about rural communities and their schools closing. You know, so there is an interesting shift and push, I think, about trying to preserve these schools, but also what to do, you know, what's next. They're not all going to be revitalized in schools. Mm -hmm. So how do we use these structures? Yeah, yeah I would say for us, um, you know, the school was built in 1954. And for me, you know, I like new. <laughs> so some of the, the building architecture to me is not very nice. But we're going to try to preserve it as best we can and modernize it at the same time. So we've been working with the architect on some of that stuff, but like some of the ceilings are just kind of too low, so we'll have to, at least for me, we'll have to <laughs> uh, redo some of that stuff. But there are some things in there that we can preserve. There are some old chalkboards that have been there for years. We want to preserve that, not necessarily for use, but maybe have it on display. There's an old intercom system that has the old school things that are hanging on there that you get your announcements on. We want to preserve that. Um, so there's things inside the school that we want to keep. Um, the, if you know anything about Northeast Oklahoma City, there's a lot of pride in those neighborhoods, Forest Park, Garden Oaks, and things like that. So we want to have, uh, you know, kind of, kind of in our uh, in our auditorium, you know, prominent, you know, former students of the school. Maybe have some history about some of the former students that went there, some of the former educators, and things like that, uh, just to kind of tell the story of, of the school as well as the history of, you know, Brown versus Board of Education and why the school is built and things like that. Uh, you know. When, when the integration that happened through uh, Brown versus Board of Education, um, tell, tell them we're busy. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of actually integrating some of these schools, there were schools built in the neighborhoods, so the students in, in that neighborhood could go to that school and you could get around integration. So uh, we want to kind of tell that story, modernize the school, keep some of the older aspects as best we can, you know, talk about some of the prominent students and educators that taught there and, and went to school there. And it just saves some of the cool old stuff that's, that's located in that building. Uh, similar, uh, what uh, 
Some of the things that we want to do that we envision uh, in the property for is uh, to remember is that uh, in the old schools, if uh, I don't know what they look like nowadays, but the, you had the lockers, you had all those lockers, and they were recessed into the wall. Well, uh, since then, all the lockers have been removed. Uh, and uh, each one of those spaces we want to use as a, a museum type spot where we'll have lighting in there and uh, glass covering in there and we'll have documents uh, of the past history of that school. So even though uh, it's not a museum, anytime you go to that attorney's office in there, now you got the opportunity to find out what this school is all about. What happened uh, back there? Uh, 1907 when they built the first one, uh, which was a little old two-room school, uh, and uh, then later on they built a four-room school, uh, where the school lives now, and then of course in the 50s, 52 I think it was, they uh, built the existing building. But uh, all throughout the school, uh, we'll probably have murals uh, of, of some uh, students that they can remember and put some pictures on the wall for uh, you know, uh, documents, uh, trophies. Um, uh, little old school, little old town, where we had a a hell of a sports team. Uh, the coach was uh, inducted into the National Coaches thing because of his record. So those type of things is to help you remember back. Not to live there, but just re see where you come from so you know where you go. I don't have any comment. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. And, and, and let me share this with you, man, because this is important. I was doing my research, collecting data to raise money to save the school. So, I found that, you know, to get a business plan, a proposal written, it cost $1,500, this one resource that I was going to I said, well, maybe I can go to OU and have a proposal specialist, help me write it, and cost me as much money. When I called out here, the lady said that, that she only write proposals for the faculty. I said, okay, well, do my research. There was a, this is acronyms, a BP, RP. What that acronym stands for is the Vice President Research and Partnership. Okay, well, if, if you guys talk about research and partnership, and we have a 501c3 school over here, then maybe we can team up some kind of way. And this is what I want to make to the Vice President. But in order for me to present this to the Vice President, I'm going to need some kind of documentation to show what I'm doing in the presentation of the school and how we can work together to uh, develop that community. And that's how I ended up top of the because when I talked to the secretary at the vice president office, he said, oh, I can't get a message because he's four or five pay ways ahead of me. I said, but you're a receptionist. Come on, come on. So anyway, <laughs> they gave me with us and this is how it all started. That's all I want to say. Thank you. all <laughs> Jeez, yeah, man, I'll take this. <laughs>
you know, beats, or Black Town Sustainable Management brand is really future sustainability. Um, so I, I love how we are working with historical preservation, and I want to kind of um, come alongside historical preservation and realize that systems have to be created, financial systems, regenerative systems have to be created um, for, for we won't have this kind of like, if we don't raise the money, it will go away. I don't, no, like, I, I have to use my two master's degrees for something, you know, like, um, so it's how to connect, how to make the right connections, and for me, it's, it's a global connection, right? How do you meet the right people to create a sustainable system so we won't have the struggle of having something last for 50 years and it goes away? Yeah, well, what you asked is, is a question that they have on grant applications. If we give you this money and you, what, what's going to happen in 10 years? So, um, number one is, we got to, for us, we want to figure out how to monetize the property. So, can we get sports leagues, you, you lie in the sports field out there that we can bring in revenue? Can we lease out some office space in there that's going to bring in revenue to help pay for the maintenance of the, the insurance and tax? Well, we don't have taxes, but insurance and the upkeep of the property. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, is as you know, you start applying for grants and you get programs set up, there's quite a bit of grant money out there. But you got to have a grant writer and a team that's working on that constantly to make sure these programs are being funded. Um, ideally, what I'd like to do is set up an endowment to where you know we have a, a large investment and we're making money off the money that we're investing, and you know in 50 years it's still here. But we're fortunate because we have our, our chapter has been around since 1938. Um, very prominent members have been a part of our chapter. Dr. G. Finley, who was very prominent in Oklahoma City uh, many years ago. Um, and we know we're going to, our legacy that our chapter is going to continue for, for a long time. So we'll have people in the backfield train. I mean, for number me right now, you know, I'm already trying to figure out who's going to take my spot when I'm ready to move on to something else. So making sure we have board members ready to step in and take on the res responsibilities, making sure we have m money coming in and making money off of money, basically. Um, and then we have a, a grant writing team that's in place to make sure the programs are funded and, you know, we're not running into a situation where, we have this nice building, but you can't pay the electric bill. So that's kind of how we're approaching it. But yeah, every we're cheap. We're being cheap. <laughs> if we can ball, get volunteers to do things, um, we're we're looking to do that. Like for instance, we're di we've done a lot of the demo on the interior of the property ourselves. There's a program to where you can get folks who may have uh, you know gotten in trouble in our certain times in, in order to get you know time off their sentence, <clears throat> get them to come out and do volunteer work. So if we can work with the contractor to say, hey, we'll utilize this resource right here to save you money on demolition and things like that, we'll do it. We're working with Metro Tech to have some of their students come out and work on some of the electrical stuff and the plumbing stuff and things like that. So we're watching every penny. Um, we want to make sure we don't get over, uh, you know, out ahead of ourselves and spending money. Um, so we always keep a reserve fund. But yeah, the goal is to have a, have a perpetuating system that's constantly funded through endowments, through grants, and things like that. I think there's a Q&A behind it. Oh, I have a question. So, it really resonated with me when you said that like, you opening this uh, boarding school is like a spiritual journey for you. And that's really awesome because, you know, um, you know, as followers of Christ, we always want to, uh, you know, do what's best for people and um, give people opportunity we didn't have before. And um, I also think you'll be highly reward, uh, rewarded for that once you get the, you know, once you get to where you're going. And um, I'm wondering if um, one of your uh, objectives for like opening like this um, boarding school, I'm not sure like what the law is how it is, but I'm wondering if one of your objectives is to maybe get these kids into like the gospel of the Lord and uh, maybe like try to educate them, um, you know, like spiritually in that way since like you're, you know, you're on your own spiritual journey and doing this. And so I was, you know, I was wondering um, how do you feel from that? That's a good question. So. Uh, this is so good. You guys are going to get some, some personal smell now, too, uh, because that also is uh, part of the journey. But I was once married, and my former husband is from Morocco. So he was North Af he's North African. And part of the intentionality for the school, and it's in the name, international, but this is the International Interfaith Boarding School. Um, and wanting to be mindful of 
how the, the African diaspora is multicultural, multi-religious, um, multilingual, and how, again, we're all over the world, and so my religion may not be another black person's religion, and that's okay. So how are you gonna create a safe space even for religion, even for the, again, the multiculturalism of the black diaspora? And for sure, so, one thing I'm really excited about is like creating, again, I talk about rhetoric and language, but you know, what does it look like for you know, a student to go to a worship center or a center where they're able to learn more about their culture, their religion within that, that space? And so this is really intentional for it to be a spiritual journey. And there's the curriculum, so I really want to share too that the school is not really built on college access. Um, it is student voice, student choice, so a lot of PBL, so project-based learning, work-based learning, and the acronym for the curriculum is FLY and STEAM AHEAD. And so there's different pillars that the school will be built on, like a mini HBCU. So an HBCU is Historically Black College University. I attended the HBCU. Um, that's a lot of my, uh, I will say, understanding of this black boarding school stems from me attending this sort of black college at such a young age. I graduated high school at 17 and went to school in a different state, you know? So I was still a child in a lot of ways of like understanding, I need my parents, you know, where are my parents? Can I, can I leave campus because I was sheltered? You know, so like, do I, do I have to call my parents to leave? You know, like, what is, this is a whole new world. It was like a different world. You know, the, the TV show <laughs> the world, <laughs> which really impacted me too to go to college and where I was to school. Um, and so the concept is really like a mini HBCU. Like, let's start early. Um, I'm not sure the statistics of how many black children actually make it to college or make it to a historically black college because of the resources in their own communities. And so it's like, how can we connect, network with the communities that they're, they're currently in? to make sure that this school creates sustainability and not losing their heritage, not losing you know, that, that piece of identity where they come from. Um, and so the, the acronym stands for, for this, uh, the curriculum of flying steam ahead is financial literacy, um, legal entities, your self-investment, and then STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, arts, not agriculture, sorry, or oh, yeah. excuse me, <laughs> uh, mathematics, and then ahead is athletics, entrepreneurship, democratic leadership, and I feel like I missed something. It's been a long week, y'all, so just bear with me. It's been a whole long week. So ultimately, there's pillars in which the curriculum is going to be built on to create that sustainability. And two things I'm really excited about, y'all. So the UVP, so the unique buying propositions of the school. So uh, we're going to have a 13th year a school facilitated gap year um, in honor of the 13th Amendment. So instead of the school to prison pipeline, we're gonna have a school to freedom pipeline. Um, and then the other, another UVP that I'm really excited about is um, the, the teacher to student ratio would not be like a one to 10 or one to 15. I actually wanna have like in class facilitators, so like two to 10 or two to 15 where you have a teacher in class and you have, using technology, you know, you have professors who can type in for a semester. And when I mean professors, I mean like the Sada Shakur, you know, who's in Cuba right now, or Angela Davis, or Tyler Perry, or Beyonce. I work this on today's part, shout out to Beyonce. Um, but like having Beyonce teach a class, right? For Will Williams, like tapping into our cultural assets, which are people. And so how can we really bridge this gap? And so there's just, I can go on and on. This is my favorite subject, you know, so. I'm done. <laughs> okay, question. Um, I guess my question is like, how, how do you plan to like get like political backing or like all of the state of Oklahoma to like support these, given it's like very conservative and frankly racist past? Like, I don't know, like are you just relying fully on community support or are you hoping that you'll get some political backing from leaders in the state? Um, I'll speak, speak for what we're trying to do. Um, I try not to look through political lens. Uh, it's about building uh, relationships and working with allies, no matter what side of the aisle they're on. Um, if you get into the political game, you're gonna, you're, it's not, not going to lead you anywhere. So um, I, 
know we're in the, one of the reddest states in the country, and we're going to need Republican support in order to achieve our goals. So I'm meeting with <laughs> anyone who is willing to support us. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. It's a benefit to the community. It's, if you want uh, kids who are now students to not end up in jail later on in life, what can you do now to support them? So do you want to pay now or do you want to pay later? So that's kind of how you know we're looking at it. It's about building, it's about allies and interests, not, not politics to me. Um, you can get caught up in that, and I don't think, I mean, I don't think it's a winning strategy, personally. May I answer that from my viewpoint? Do you mind? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, a few weeks back, the governor pardoned Julius Jones was glimpsed with life. So I called the governor's office. Okay? I thanked him for sparing his brother's life, but at the same time, I asked him if he would use his platform to help me save my school. Now, as everybody knows, Oklahoma State Penitentiary is in Macalester. Okay, now you saved this man's life, but let's try to save this school, which means so much to the other black kids, so they don't end up with the penitentiary. Okay, I'm bold enough to call the governor to ask him for his support. I'm also bold enough to call the Brent Hensley, who is the president of KOCO. I went out to the, the, the radio, I mean the TV station, physically. Of course, he didn't let me even have to open the door out because of COVID, I don't know. But I said, I'm here because I want to talk to the president of CEO, KOCO. And they asked me why. I said, well, he gave a, a, a speech about how what Martin Luther King stood for as far as helping other people. And I was so moved and impressed by what he said that I wanted to share with him what I was trying to do. And what I, what I told the people at the door because they wouldn't let me in, I said, listen, my name is Clarence Ellis Jr. I'm from McAllister, Oklahoma. The name of the school is El Overture High School. And uh, we have a panel that we're going to meet February the 3rd. Here's my phone number. Okay, here's the date. And I'm asking somebody to send some, uh, one of the news reporters out to cover the story. So I'm serious about mine. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, current events, when Joe, President Joe Biden said that he's committing $122 billion for schools. I'm hoping that he would include my historical school that I graduated from. Okay? But I'm bold enough to confront him. I don't care who I have for this money, man. I'm serious about it, folks. I'm about it. I got to have it. You know, I want to be able to put, uh, I have a little, it's like, uh, Tan hide of an Indian that found it uh, in a garage sale. Oh my God. Why you in that? I agree with him too, but that's my bud. But I agree with him. Uh, when I'm looking for resources, I look to everybody. I used to, uh, when I first moved to Oklahoma City uh, from a little country town, didn't know what I was doing, I got in to some kind of job selling magazines and they took us down to Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, after you knocked on their first nine doors and all of them said no, well then uh, you start trying to pick and choose what door you want. And guess what, when you start doing that, you miss the door that was the door that you need. So I, I will reach out to everybody with my story. It's up to them, it's like tennis. I've been serving to tell you with my story. Now it's up to them if they heard enough or uh, care enough that they serve it back. So yeah, everybody's uh, on, on the watch list. Yeah. And just to follow up, there are uh, state COVID funds available, ARPA funds, um, that you have to apply for. You have to go through the process on their website. But once you're, you meet the eligibility requirements, it goes to a committee of legislators who decide, hey, this is a group that we're going to get funding to, and this is how much. And so we can't depend on, you know, the only Democrats to support oh, what we're yeah. trying to do. It's, you know, it's not red or blue, it's green in, in my book. So, uh, you know, I would talk to you, like I said, I'll talk to anyone, um, and we'll try to, like I said, try to make this happen. I appreciate it.
actively feel called, really called Oklahoma. Um, again, kind of hearing my story of not even being from the state. And a few, I would say, incidents that makes me feel like really rooted here and, um, again, feeling like I'm called. So Oklahoma currently is the number one for highest prison rates in the United States. And it's been like that, of course, for, for some time now. And so part of the school goal is to eradicate the school prison pipeline while creating generational wealth for families. Being here in Oklahoma also is really unique because I still feel like it's a wild, wild west here. Like, things that happen here won't happen in any other state, <laughs> but it happens here. And I like to look at that as an advantage, to be honest. Um, like, what ways can it benefit myself in the, in the mission that I'm doing here? And when I look at boarding schools, um, for instance, Sequoia High School is in Tahlequah. That is a boarding school. And in order to even attend that boarding school, you need a Native American ID card. In order to even work at that boarding school, you need a Native American ID card. You know, it's very protected. And so it's just like, there are um, examples here that again, that probably wouldn't happen in any other state to build an all black boarding school. And I've toured um, Sequoia High School, which it was awesome. So all the experiences I've received so far here in Oklahoma has literally been life-changing. And then on the other side, holding the position of um, town manager, you know, local government, municipalities in this state has also been quite unique. And so I've been able to be a rooms I never thought I would be in and to advocate and to speak on not only for the King County International, but for Tallahassee and for other black townships. Um, so yeah, I think ultimately I just, uh, I see people's heart you know, and that's black and white. And I know kind of how to navigate and move in certain ways. And I would love to, again, share about Tallahassee making U.S. history this past year and also uh, in their revitalization efforts due to the Tulsa massacre. And so we kicked off this 30 day community cleanup. And due to that, more coalition and more stands for mayors organized for reparations and equity. And more was started, co-founded by, the coalition was co-founded by the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and the mayor of Denver, Michael B. B. Hancock. And so we're, of course, the only town to be on this coalition. Um, 11 U.S. mayors founded this kind of coalition, and it's the mayor of Sacramento, the mayor of Denver, the mayor of Kansas City, the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, the mayor of Austin, Texas, the mayor of Durham, North Carolina, and it's the mayor of Tallahassee, Oklahoma. You know, so it's just like, wait, what? USA Today, NPR, CBS News, um, again, the Washington Post was just here this past week. And it's due to the interest of what Tallahassee is doing in honor of the state, right? And so long story short, someone who sits on our advisory commission, so each mayor has to have an advisory commission on this coalition. And the Lieutenant Governor, Matt Pinnell, sits on our advisory commission. And this is, again, the same season as when the governor being critical race theory. So there's pockets of opportunity and like momentum and growth. Like if you stay the course, if you're, if there's, if you don't become distracted, I would say with the surrounding ills, the social ills, and you're just completely focused on the goals at hand. And I'm completely focused on the goals at hand. So again, my situation is not looking at currently the political scheme, political context of not just Oklahoma, but the United States. I'm not there. I'm looking at future sustainability. I'm looking at economics, you know, how to build sustainable communities. And having a school is an anchor, but I'm also real blessed to be looking at rebuilding municipalities. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's networking and partnerships, and, you know. It doesn't matter who you really are. It's, well, it matters if your heart is just built and, and solid and pure, and that can be on both sides. So it's obvious, this is to Keith and Alice, uh, it's obvious to me that um, y'all school means a lot to you, and that, especially that teacher that impacted y'all so much. And so I was wondering, what about that really set that um, pride in you? 